Hello, and welcome to Exploring Intersections, Catholic Sisters on Racism, Migration, and Climate. Here's our host, Charish Budzinski. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Exploring Intersections. This program is made possible through the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, Region 10. Throughout this series, we're talking with panelists about some of the biggest social issues of our time. If you've missed our past programs, you can watch them on YouTube or download a podcast version. Today, our panel conversation centers on education justice. Education lays the groundwork for the future success of individuals, families, communities, and nations. Yet, inequities exist. Lack of access to quality education is a root cause of poverty and it is intertwined with complex issues like racism, migration, and climate change. What's at stake and what can and must be done to achieve equity in education? To help us better understand today's topic, we are joined by three panelists. Born and raised in Southeastern Wisconsin, Megan DeWayne received a bachelor's degrees in English and history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. After working in the private sector for five years, she returned to UW-Madison to fulfill her lifelong goal of becoming a teacher. She earned her master's degree in curricula curriculum and instruction with licenses to teach English and English as a second language. Megan is currently teaching at a public high school in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is largely comprised of students from low-income backgrounds. Reinforced by her own classroom experience, she seeks opportunities to fight for education equity for all students. Welcome, Megan. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Mary Elizabeth Grimes has been the president of Marion Middle School in St. Louis, Missouri since 2013. With more than 20 years of experience, Mary Elizabeth has led both for-profits and nonprofits through growth and transition. Prior to her role at Marion, Mary Elizabeth served as state director at the Greater Missouri Chapter of March of Dimes. Mary Elizabeth received her bachelor's degree in English from Spelman College and an executive MBA from Washington University. As president, she is responsible for staff oversight, financial management, fund development, strategic planning, and operations for the school. In December 2016, she received the Incarnate Word Leadership Award for Exemplary Leadership and for Mentoring Marian Girls. Welcome, Mary Elizabeth. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. And Sister Mary Willette has spent much of her life in Catholic schools as a student, teacher, academic dean, and administrator. In 1968, Sister Mary professed vows as a school sister of Notre Dame, a community with the charism of education. <laughs> Guided and inspired by this charism, she learned that education gives young people the opportunity to develop to their full potential and a power to transform the world. Following years of ministry in the traditional Catholic schools, Sister Mary began service as principal of San Miguel Middle School of Minneapolis, a school designed to educate and empower inner city youth. After serving five years as coordinator at the Generalate of the School Sisters of Notre Dame in Rome, Italy, Sister Mary returned to formal education at Crystal Ray Jesuit High School in Minneapolis, where she presently serves as coordinator of volunteers. Sister Mary received her bachelor's degree in religious education from Mount Mary in Milwaukee, a master's degree in theology from St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota, and her administrative licensure from the University of St. Mary's in Minneapolis. Welcome, Sister Mary. I'm happy to be here. Often the terms equity and equality are used interchangeably. So it's important for us to draw a distinction between the two for this conversation. The term equality means everyone gets the same thing, no matter what their needs are. The term equity means everyone gets everything they need to be the same. With that in mind, 
Let's explore the concept of education justice. Mary Elizabeth, first tell us what exactly is education justice and what does it mean to have equity versus equality in the education space? Well, thank you for asking the question. And it really is uh, a very big question to ask. So education justice involves schools and communities that work together to provide equitable and adequate distribution of educational resources. It also means that there should be highly qualified teachers in the schools to provide a quality instruction for the students. Within that course curriculum, there should be innovative and advanced classes. There should also be a focus on restorative justice to ensure that all students graduate high school ready, but also that they are prepared to go into post-secondary education and enter into sustainable careers. So as you mentioned, the distinction between equality and, and equity is one that equality is concerned with what's fair for the group versus um, equity, particularly for those students who may be in marginalized groups, um, they need to have something that specifically meets their unique needs. Um, and that does cross boundaries of educational tools and resources and assistance that they meet, need for you know, what is specifically unique uh, for them. So the beautiful thing about this uh, illustration is in equality, every child is standing on one box. In equity, because you have one child that is very tall, one child that is very short, um, the smallest child needs to stand on two boxes in order to see over the fence. One would note that in the equality situation versus equity, the tallest child still can see over the fence, even though he's not standing on a box. This is critically important because oftentimes when you get into conversations about equality and equity, someone feels as though something has been taken from them in order to serve someone else. When in fact, you're really just trying to help others without marginalizing anyone else so that everyone has what is going to be fair for them to have access. The last picture is one that I really appreciate. And that is where there's no fence at all. So in a perfect world, uh, what we would hope is that everybody has access without what I would consider a barrier, which is what the fence can serve as being, uh, to be removed for the benefit of all. Um, so just to give an illustration in my world, for example, when our students uh, were experiencing shelter in place, we knew two things would have to happen. One is there wouldn't be um, the same kind of technologically, uh, ac technological access in each home, even though we were giving laptops and iPads to the students. So in those instances, we added a hotspot so they would have internet access. We also knew that there would be food insecurity in the home because oftentimes the meals that we provide at our school are a major source of nutrition for our students. And so we went to the grocery store every week and we provided our families with food and household resources that they, we felt that they would have some difficulty in securing. So um, it's a long answer, but I hope that uh, for our listeners on podcast and also those who are joining us today, um, have an understanding of the difference. Thank you, Mary Elizabeth, for explaining that. And for those who are joining us by podcast, if you want to view the graphic that we're referring to, you can see that on our website, exploringintersections.org. So now let's back up just a little bit. I'm really interested in understanding what experiences in your lives and in your work lives have made the issue of education justice important to you. Sister Mary, let's start with you on that one. 
when I was a child, um, students didn't have access um, for the busing to the local Catholic school. So my dad decided to buy a bus, hire a driver, create a route and charge a minimal amount for families. And this impressed me as in his own way, he wanted justice and education. A second experience I had was uh, I spent a summer in Honduras and in the midst of that poverty, I realized that I could not feel the call to be a missionary, but I knew when I came home that I wanted to do everything possible to work for justice. And one of those ways was to work in schools that would serve students who had um, a greater economic need than I originally experienced in my time as a teacher. So that really um, moved me to understand the need for justice and education. That's a beautiful story. Megan, how did this become a topic that interests you? Sure. Um, from a young age, my parents really impressed upon me the importance of education. And when I think about the experiences I had as a student versus now, as you mentioned, I'm a teacher teaching in a public school here in Milwaukee. And I think about the different, the different experiences that I had as a student versus the experience that my current students are having. And those differences are stark. Um, that is a stark contrast that I'm seeing, I'm experiencing every single day. And when I think about those differences in opportunity, in equity, like um, Sister Mary Elizabeth was, or sorry, Mary Elizabeth was just explaining, um, it really ignited my passion for um, this fight for education justice. Great. And Mary Elizabeth, how did education justice become an important topic for you? Well, I want to give my mother credit here because she was a dedicated teacher and counselor. And so she really set the stage for me in terms of the importance of education, but also always looking to that student who everyone said was the lost cause. And even though she taught all day long, she would bring that student to our house to have dinner and also to tutor um, you know, children so that they could have uh, the benefit of, of learning. Uh, however, when I was in elementary school, it was really when there were these initial um, advances to try and educate as well as integrate schools. Uh, but in my experience, uh, my fourth grade class got on a bus along with my teacher and we traveled to an all white school in South St. Louis. There was never any interaction with the students at the school. We just got off the bus, went to our classroom, spent the entire day together, got back on the bus and went back home. And so you can imagine that this was really a failed attempt at integration, equality, and even equity because education didn't become better just because we were in a different school building. Um, so if you're going to be intentional about providing quality education, you have to start with the needs of the children that you're serving and not do it according to zip code or color of a child's skin. Mm -hmm. Such a profound personal experience. Thank you for sharing that. Tell us about the scope of this problem. What kinds of inequities have each of you witnessed in your work and personal experience with education? Sister Mary? Um, I guess I've witnessed a variety of um, this in, in, edu in the education that I've experienced. I think some of it is rooted deeply in our history, deeply in the history of education. Um, not all schools have equitable curriculum. Not all schools have equity in terms of the teachers that they're able to hire. Um, not all parents and guardians are able to navigate the educational system because of their own lack of education. Uh, there's fluency in education that's not equitable. Um, sometimes bias on the part of teachers and staff impacts equity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mary Elizabeth, how about you? Uh, what is the scope of this problem through, through the lens of your experience, both professionally and personally? 
So at Marion Middle School, we were founded on the premise of quality education is a key factor to breaking the cycle of poverty. But we also believe that systemic change is necessary beyond meeting basic needs uh, for those who are caught in the cycle of poverty. It is important that uh, they not only identify what the root causes of the poverty are, but also create strategies, which includes advocacy uh, to change those structures and to keep them uh, from continuing along that path. So that means that um, in addition to all that, systemic change also requires a transformation of attitudes, not only the people who we are serving, but those people who have uh, some influence or uh, ability to be able to change systems um, to make instrumental and significant uh, changes needed. So at Marion, we serve a diverse population. Our students come to us two to three grades behind. By the time they finish uh, graduating eighth grade, on average, they're a grade above. So our model is one where we continue to stay in the lives of our students in high school, and in college. And so the statistics that we see, which are making a difference in the scenario that I just presented to you, is that 100% of our students graduate from middle school, high school, and 100% of them go on uh, to uh, enter into college or post-secondary education. As opposed to the scenario we see in St. Louis, there was a research done a few years ago called For the Sake of All, and I encourage uh, those who are not familiar with it to Google it and read the report. But in one section, it says the highest level of education among African-American men and women, but I'll give the statistic for, for women since we educate girls, um, for women 25 and older uh, in St. Louis, only 25% of that population had a high school diploma. 28% had some college. So these were motivating factors for us at Marion to know that we really needed to continue on the path of what we were doing to make a difference in those outcomes. Mm. Great. And Megan, tell us about the scope of the problem through the lens of your personal and professional experience. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think the scope is, is massive. Um, when I think about my high school experience versus the experience in the school where I teach, you have a difference in expectation, academic expectations for the students. That is huge. You have, um, as Sister Mary referenced, a difference in hiring abilities for the school. You have a difference in opportunities, both academic and extracurricular for the students. There's a difference in resources that are available to the students. And as um, both of my fellow panelists mentioned, there's differences in their lives outside of school that need to be addressed um, in different ways that really aren't, aren't being addressed um, as they should be. So, I mean, the list goes on, but just to give a few examples of differences that I see in those two experiences. Mm, great, and we'll stick with you on this one too, Megan. What are some of the core reasons that these inequities exist? Because I think that's a natural uh, continuation of your answer. I think that um, you, we cannot possibly talk about these inequities in the school without also having a conversation about these inequities that exist in the communities. Um, communities and schools go hand in hand. A child does not come to school and leave their outside life at the door, just as we don't as, as educators and as workers at the school. So if we are talking about this, um, you know, striving for education justice, the strive for equity, we need to be thinking about what that looks like in the school and what that looks like in the community. Um, Mary mentioned, Mary Elizabeth mentioned poverty as a huge issue. I really do think that's a big issue. Um, and so it definitely extends beyond the school walls. And the root cause of that is some of the things I mentioned at school, but also some of the things I mentioned in the community 
And I think you can tie both of those things, at least in part, to funding. I think that there needs to be more focus and more money put into education and in an equitable way, not an equal way. Um, a way that makes it so that schools who service low-income students have money for more mental health resources, for example. And that's not something I see happening right now on the scale that it needs to be happening. Great. Mary Elizabeth, uh, any additional thoughts on core reasons why these inequities exist? I, I know you have a unique perspective as an administrator as well. Well, I just want to underscore what Megan said with respect to uh, poverty and its long-term impact on um, you know, what happens with the individuals who experience poverty. So again, I go back to uh, the statistics of one in three African-Americans versus um, one in 10 uh, whites in St. Louis are in poverty. And so the ripple effect of that is, you know, what happens with the children uh, who are at risk because about 50% uh, of African-American children here also live in poverty. So the health outcomes uh, for those children uh, become evidence of the life that they live. And uh, so there are all kinds of statistics that talk about the inequities that are even in healthcare. Um, so the uh, long-term impact that we need in order to change this is we know what happens when individuals have higher levels of education. They have the ability to get better jobs. They have the ability to have health insurance. Um, they can have retirement savings and they pay for childcare, et cetera. So all of these things help to make a difference long-term for the individual and the family. Uh, so, um, it is critically important that we consider what is happening in terms of the distinction between those who don't have the means, uh, which also takes place in the educational environment, but also plays out long-term for individuals. The other thing that I will add, which is critically important and Megan touched on it as well, is the social emotional component that is um, important for children in our schools because they have faced a number of traumatic experiences which impact um, their ability, first of all, not because they don't have potential to learn, but because they're having to navigate through the traumatic experiences that they've had um, to uh, manage that and uh, their, their education. Yeah, absolutely. Sister Mary, any additional thoughts on core reasons behind these inequities? I think I would only add one, and that is that I think we need to continue to help our legislators understand the needs in education and um, lobby with them to um, get the, the needs met. And then also to know what is going on in our local situations with school boards and to be sure that we're active in the voting for school board members. Absolutely, and it seems more important than ever, actually. I know all of you have experience in education in urban settings. How have you seen curriculum address the particular needs of urban students? Sister Mary, let's start with you. Well, I work at Crystal Ray Jesuit High School in Minneapolis, and two branches of our curriculum help our students become career ready and academically successful. Our students work one day a week, and they are prepared for that experience by learning appropriate technology, um, writing skills, executive functioning skills, um, task analysis, organizing, goal setting, decision making. And the corporate sponsors where our students work pay the school to help offset tuition. And they also mentor and supervise our students. So it's a real life experience. And then the second part is that our curriculum is extensive in terms of standards that students need to meet. And our teachers have done a lot of work on instructional um, guidelines. We have an instructional leadership team that prepares staff development based on data 
and what is needed by our students and how we can support our teaching staff. Well, that's great. Mary Elizabeth, how has curriculum at Marion addressed the unique needs of students that are in an urban setting? So I think uh, children need an opportunity to be able to see what are the possibilities for them to succeed after they finish education. So we have uh, a focus in uh, not only putting uh, resources and uh, tools in our students' toolbox as they move from middle school, high school, and college, but we also have an emphasis of job readiness starting at the middle school level. And uh, we are exposing them to career options that may not be on their radar at this point. But once being introduced to it, um, you know, and Sister Mary mentioned that through Crystal Ray and what they're doing. Um, but at the middle school level, we introduce them to professionals in the community. And they have an opportunity to engage with them to learn more about the careers that they have. So they expands their aspiration of what they might consider becoming uh, as they continue with their education. So STEM is a primary focus. It has been a primary focus for the past few years. And uh, it is often said that students who um, you know, are African-American and female don't like science and math. And those are two things that we focus on uh, so that uh, our students are proficient in both of those areas. And so about 90% of our students at this point are saying that they have aspirations to continue in STEM careers. I love that. Megan, how have you seen curriculum address the particular needs of urban students? I think there's several ways that I'm seeing this being done at my current school. We have uh, what we call our college and career center. And um, I teach mostly seniors, mostly upperclassmen. So I work very closely with the folks in our college and career center. And throughout junior and senior year, they are coming into the classroom. They are talking to students about different careers, things that you know, if you want to go to college, here are opportunities related to that. If you want to get into the trades, here are opportunities related to that. The military, what are the different paths available to you? How, how would you go about going down them? Um, that's a big focus at our school is to get students college and career ready when they leave high school. Um, another really nice thing about my school is the flexibility that our administrators give staff on our curriculum. Of course, we need to adhere to state standards, but how we do that and what that looks like in our classroom is up to us. So I, as a teacher, have the ability to form relationships with my students, get to know them, and then build and develop a curriculum around the people in the classroom with me, which is um, a really amazing thing and I think is a lot more effective than if you're just doing you know, something out of the box. Um, what that also allows me to do is bring in things that aren't necessarily English, but are still important to the students. Um, I have our guidance team and our social workers come into our school or come into my classroom periodically to talk to students about mental health and about social emotional needs. And we do writing prompts and things related to that. So the flexibility that we have in our curriculum really allows us to tailor it to the students that we have in front of us. Great. Mary Elizabeth, let's start with you on this one. In your experience, how has education justice intersected with issues of racism, migration, and climate change? I know we've touched on racism here. I would say the biggest thing um, that comes to my mind is the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, a national trend wherein, you know, children are being funneled out of public schools and into um, the juvenile, juvenile and criminal uh, justice system. And so for many of these students, which are, you know, similar to the students that we serve, you know, they're not only in poverty, but they, you know, have a history of abuse and neglect. And what would benefit them is, you know, trying to meet their educational needs and also supplement that with counseling services. But instead, they've, you know, been isolated or punished. 
and really pushed out of the educational system. Uh, what was also interesting to me, again, because I, I, Marion is a school for girls, is that the statistics show that Black girls are uh, more likely to be suspended or expelled from school um, than, um, than other uh, groups. Very interesting. Sister Mary, what are your thoughts on how education justice intersects with racism, migration, and climate change? One of the things that I've noticed is with climate change and the natural disasters, it seems to me that the same families that struggle with education and the inequities of education end up with the inequities caused by natural disasters. It's the same, which is the STEM is, is um, climate change. And so, you know, when I see the families that try to, you know, rebuild after a, a natural disaster, the families that have the most struggle are the families that live in poverty and that struggle to navigate the educational system. Mm -hmm. Also, I think with migration, um, families move a lot. It's not unusual for students to have attended a number of elementary schools and middle schools before they come to high school, um, which has usually a negative impact on their um, academic progress. As Mary Elizabeth was saying, students come you know, quite far behind academically to our high school. And so we need to find ways to, to help them um, bridge that gap. Um, families that migrate from another country often struggle to know how to navigate the system. And they're not only trying to enculturate here, but they're still supporting their family and their country of origin. And Megan, in your experience, how has education justice intersected with racism, migration, and climate change? Um, yes, I think from a perspective of racism, um, as we've been talking about, this cycle of poverty is something that ideally education can help break that. And, but that means that we need to be putting those students in our schools in a place where when they're leaving our school, they are ready for college or they are ready for their career. They are ready to um, go out there in a competitive world where they are not going to necessarily have all of the support that they hopefully had in the school. And we need to make sure that they're ready for that so that they can be competitive and they can break those cycles. And that I think goes hand in hand with equity because that might mean that we need to give a little bit more to them when they're in middle school, high school than other students get who may already have existing advantages or may have less barriers that they're going to face in that process. And so I think um, education, justice and racism, we need to be um, acknowledging that those barriers exist for some students don't exist for other students. And we need to be addressing that. And we need to figure out how to navigate and make up for those differences in the education system. Um, I also think from a migration perspective, in addition to being our senior English teacher, I'm also our ESL teacher and ESL coordinator. ESL is English as a second language. And so I work with the students at our school whose families did come here from other countries. The majority of those students came from African countries and a few students from Southeast Asian countries. Some of them come with little to no English. Some of them come with little or no previous education. And because that population is smaller um, in our school, in our district, it's easy for them to be forgotten about. Instead of being supported in that same way, we're giving them those extra supports so that they can, you know, something as simple as learn English, a basic tool that every one of us needs in our toolbox if, if we're going to be fully, you know, successful in this, in our current society. So I think um, those things go perfectly hand in hand together. Sarah, can I just add, based Please. on what Megan was saying, um, what you see there is the importance of understanding intersectionality when it comes to um, a child. So it's not only race and education, it's their culture, it may be class, um, it may be gender, age, ability, and um, their ethnicity. 
And so uh, with all of this multiplicity of dynamics with a child in um, a school system that is not uh, serving them, that really helps to add to their difficulty to be able to navigate what is, uh, has been given to, to other students. Yeah, well, I think if I can add to that really fast too, I think one of the, a big thing that I always try to think about is at a school, we need to be supporting the full, the full person that is in front of us. We are supporting them as a student. We are supporting them academically, but we are also looking at and acknowledging who are they outside of these school walls. And we are recognizing that whole person. And as a school, we are recognizing and supporting their entirety, not just who they are as a student, who they are when they're sitting in front of me in my classroom. It's such a massive challenge. I can only imagine what it's like. Why should all people care about education equity? Megan, let's start with you. Sure, um, not to be cliche, um, but these kids are the future of our country. They are. And um, we also know that historically, um, our country has not been an equitable place for a lot of different groups of people, um, both related to racism, related to immigration. Um, there's been a lot of inequity pretty much since the founding of our country. And it is our duty to do something about it, to try and fill in some of those gaps. Um, and I also think that we as a country are going to be better off wholly if all of us as a country have more access to education. All of us as a country have access to secondary education, have access to proper career training, have access to proper social emotional support. If one of us are better, if the group of us are better, we are all going to improve from that. You know, that is, there is collective improvement to be had from looking at these groups and from supporting these groups that have previously not gotten that support. And this was mentioned previously, I believe by Mary Elizabeth, but it's giving some of these groups extra support does not mean taking away from support and opportunities from other people. Um, and I think that's another reason why we should all care about this. I'm not taking something away from you, but it, we're, we can keep your opportunities, keep your experiences while also helping and supporting these other people. So it, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> Great. Mary Elizabeth, your thoughts? Why should everyone care about this issue? Well, I certainly agree with everything Megan said. And I think that society has a moral obligation to make sure that all children receive an adequate education and give them the skills that they need to become contributing adults in society. Um, so off the top, I, mean, I, I think that based again on what Megan said, uh, how are you seeing that child? I mean, every child uh, is born with some talent and ability to be able to contribute to society. Uh, and if it's not properly nurtured, we will never see uh, the benefit or receive the benefit of, of that. And so it's almost like having human talent go to waste because you haven't developed it. You know, long term, however, um, there's a financial cost. So going back to the illustration, again, as Megan and I said, the tallest person didn't lose anything, but the loss becomes in because you didn't try to do what you could to help the person who needed it. That means that there's a financial cost because of poor education. Uh, it means you know, lower income, uh, poor economic growth, reduced tax revenue, uh, higher cost in healthcare and social security, and even could ultimately result in increasing crime. So you're really not helping to create a holistic society that is going to benefit all of us by saying, I'm only going to give to this group or a narrow group without thinking about how it's going to benefit the whole. Very well said. Sister Mary, I know it's I know education is your charism for your community, but why should everybody care about education equity? I think, first of all, for me, education gives people power, a power in a good sense. 
And so, as both of the other two panelists have said, if we're not going to give every single student an opportunity to develop their potential, whether you know they have more opportunities to start with or less, we we need to find ways. We need to find ways to educate every single one of them and help them develop to the fullest of their potential because that's what will change the world. That's what will transform the world. They will make that happen. Great. If we make equity and education happen. Absolutely. If you could create a new model for education, what factors would you consider as part of the model and why? Sister Mary, let's start with you on this one. Well, being in a Crystal Ray school, I think there's just a lot of um, components that we have that I would like to, to see continued if we were going to develop something, and that would be the work component, which really gives opportunity to students to see what is out there and what they can do and they can be. Um, I would like to, to also have the component that I know was mentioned already, but um, the opportunity for all families and all students to get support for um, college readiness and for college um, applications and um, scholarships for, um, so we provide um, college counseling and alumni counseling. So once our students do go to college, they do have support because um, they, they don't know what's available to them and their parents usually are not the ones that can help them because most of the time they're first in their families to go to college. And then I think um, there's just a lot of things. We need social workers, we need a strong, um, curriculum that really meets the needs of the students that we're serving. As Megan was saying, you know, if we can have the freedom to develop curriculum that meets the students' needs that are sitting in front of us, those are a few of the things that I think are important. Great ideas. Mary Elizabeth, I feel like this question is perfect for you, but maybe you're already living in that model. Uh, what factors would you consider as part of a new model for education and why? Well, certainly as Sister uh, Mary said, uh, with our model of starting in middle school and continuing to stay with our girls all the way through college, um, not every educational institution can do that. However, it has proven to be successful for those that we serve. Uh, the other emphasis is, again, similar to the Crystal Ray model, is not only preparing them for each advanced education, but also that job readiness component. So for us, we have also instituted working with companies here in the city of St. Louis to give our alums internship opportunities. And so that's a win-win for uh, both the student as well as the employer, because hopefully with the educational support that we're giving our students, uh, they're able to go to great high schools and go on to college, or like I said, some um, other post-secondary education. But for the employer, what they're doing is grooming a person who is likely to be uh, hired after they get out of school. So with the emphasis on DEI, now they're not having to look for a qualified candidate. This is someone who's been in their workforce. But going back to what is available to other schools, you know, an educational system, um, you know, is at its best one that um, gives students an opportunity to perform at their best potential. And so that means, you know, a strong support system, you know, even if that is counseling and a social work or a therapist, whatever the case may be, uh, for that particular uh, student body that the school is serving. But most certainly the school has to be well funded. And I would say an investment in two ways, an investment in good teachers. You cannot put a price on a good teacher. And maybe I'm a little biased because my mother was one of them but I know the impact that a good teacher has on the life of a child. But the other part is that the teacher is invested in the growth and development of the students. 
So both of those two things are critically important. And Megan, how about you? If you could create a new model for education, what would you consider as part of the model? Um, I would like to echo the things that both of my fellow panelists said. Um, a couple of additional things that I was thinking about, I know social emotional learning was mentioned. Um, I would love to see social emotional curriculum be implemented as part of the core curriculum. You have math, you have English, you have science, you have social emotional health, and it is a core class that you take all through high school um, where you're developing different social emotional needs and that might look different at different schools. And so that's where that curriculum flexibility comes in where that class is going to be suitable for the students you have in front of you. But I would love to see something like that added to the core curriculum. Um, I would also love to see expanded extracurricular activities. There's a lot of research and studies that have been done to show the positive impacts that extracurricular, both extracurricular tied to academics, extracurricular tied to speech, debate, theater, extracurricular tied to academic um, programs. Are, there's a lot of really positive things that can come out of that. And then I would also, um, we need to have universal high expectations for all of our students. If they're coming in to our school behind, whatever happened, we need to meet them where they're at, and, but still hold them and adhere to those high expectations that we're holding everybody else to. Um, so those are some additional things I would really love to see in an ideal school setting. Really great. I love seeing the future of education or the potential through your eyes. <laughs> we are living in truly extraordinary times, and we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about that. How has the COVID pandemic changed education and what weaknesses in public and private education systems have been revealed by the pandemic? Sister Mary, let's start with you. Well, I think for us, one of the first um, inequities we discovered was the fact that we weren't ready to go online um, and to do everything remotely. And um, we didn't have what our students needed to make that happen for them. So after six months of struggle, you know, we found ways to provide the technology necessary, as someone else had mentioned, with computers and hotspots and, you know, whatever, whatever was needed, and then a lot of training for our teachers. So that was a big area. And then I think, too, um, another area that's changed education is to see what loneliness, depression, um, does to students in terms of their academic growth. Um, our students in Minneapolis not only struggled with the pandemic, but at the same time, we were in the midst of a whole lot of violence right in our own neighborhood. So our students were trying to navigate the pandemic and trying to navigate how to live in the midst of that violence and everything that happened. And it's, it just requires so much um, support um, social workers, counselors, um, for families, as well as um, for the students themselves. Um, we also found that, you know, families relied on the school for food. So, you know, we needed our nutrition program delivered food every week to about 150 families. Um, so there, there's just um, so many things. Parents and guardians lost their jobs. And so students had to work to support their families. Um, and then students fell behind academically because it just, I mean, many students didn't log on to um, online learning and therefore um, just fell behind. Mm -hmm. So those are some. Mary Elizabeth, in your experience, how has the COVID pandemic changed education and what weaknesses has it revealed? Well, I believe that uh, Sister Mary really hit on all of the, the high points that were experienced nationwide in schools in urban settings. You know, it's a situation where there were already challenges that existed. So when COVID came along slash shelter in place, it only exacerbated what was already there. And so when we returned to school, we were fortunate in that we developed a care team to be able to support our students and their families. Uh, however, 
this team of, of individuals in our, our school are just really maxed out with the need that um, our students have and their families have. Uh, I mean, down to the very basic needs. I mean, certainly food insecurity is, you know, one of the basic needs, uh, but, you know, housing and, um, you know, again, because families have lost their jobs, all of those things impact uh, the students as well, uh, particularly in the area of trauma that they're experiencing as a result of being in neighborhoods or homes that uh, are not always safe. I think I just want to add on to that too. I think what we discovered is our students didn't have the space in their homes yes. to log on. They might have had three or four siblings. And so five of them needed to be logging on and we provided a hotspot, but they didn't have five places in their homes. So yeah. it, it just pointed was, out another inequity to me yeah, and I to us. I agree and I echo with both what both of you are saying. I think the biggest thing this pandemic did was highlight the inequities that already exist and probably shine light on some that we weren't even necessarily aware of. I know I had students who wanted to come to school, who wanted to learn, but they were half listening because since they were home and their siblings were out of school, they were the babysitters during the day. So that impacted their education. There were, um, like Sister Mary mentioned, students who had really loud home environments for various reasons. There were students whose parents lost their jobs in the pandemic, so they were working and couldn't come to school. There was all sorts of reasons where all the technology issues and access aside, just, you know, even if you had all that in place, you still had other barriers to your education um, when you were at home. And I think the other thing this pandemic really showed a lot of people, this wasn't news to some people, I think it was news to some people, other people is how central schools are in so much more than just academics. Um, it was mentioned for a lot of students, that's where they eat is school. For a lot of students, that's where they get your social emotional support. That's where you get discipline. That is where you get a safe place to unwind. And I think people were coming to realize the giant role, the massive role that school plays outside of just academics. And, um, you know, you would hope as we're coming out of this, that that would be used um, and thought about as laws and rules are changing and funding is changing. You would hope that that picture, those things that were highlighted would be um, motivation for change, for steps towards this hopefully equitable future. And what I'd also like to add, both of you are at the high school level and we're seeing uh, children and the effects of COVID or shelter in place at a much younger age. So there is a great deal of focus that we're having to put on uh, helping to bring them up to grade level more than ever because they were, as I said, already two to three grades behind. Now they're farther behind. And so in order for us to get them to the place where they're able to come into your high school and be proficient, it is taking more work from the excellent, uh, for our excellent teachers to be able to pour into them uh, and ensure that uh, they're able to, to perform well uh, in high school. I do think the, the excuse me. I do think the pandemic also um, revealed to me a couple positive things. I was just amazed at how resilient our students are, and also um, just all the kinds of skills of navigation and life that they learn. So academically, they lost out on some things, but some life skills that they learned in the pandemic. Um, are something that will serve them for the rest of their lives. Yeah, there are definitely so many students who, despite all of the challenges, all of the inequities that we just mentioned, figured out how to make the best of it. And it, it was encouraging. You know, I would log on and I would see smiling faces despite everything else that was going on. And that was so encouraging, so motivational for me. You know, the, the power and the strength that our kids have is, is mm -hmm. really amazing. I, agree. I think in a lot of cases, they're having to overcome adversities anyway. This just really helped to 
uh, develop more grit than they already had. <laughs> Fascinating insights. We do have a question from our audience, even, and I'll just throw this out to anyone who feels like they can take this one on, even in our public school system, tremendous inequities exist between school districts, often as a result in the difference in school financing. How do we reconcile the use of public choice voucher legislation that diverts funding from public to private schools? It's a good question. It is a good question, but I think that this gets back to an issue that even Sister Mary mentioned, and that is the power of the vote. Because those kinds of things are being legislated and uh, you know who you put in those positions are either going to be for that or against it. So, you know, it comes down to the people who have the ability to vote for individuals who are going to provide what they think is necessary for children. Hold on that. I think that in order to do what may, Sister Mary, or sorry, I keep calling you Sister Mary, Sister <laughs> Elizabeth, um, in order to do what Mary Elizabeth just mentioned, people have to be educated about what's going on. I think there's a lot of people who would hear the question you just posed and have absolutely no idea what it meant. And so I think there needs to be a lot wider interest in, and education in the goings on of education in order for then people to make, um, to vote and to hear, have those voices be heard. Uh, I Megan, think in Minnesota. Oh, sorry. Yes. Go ahead, Sister Mary. There has been a lot of lobbying for vouchers, but I don't, I mean, it's, it's never, succeeded it's never passed so I think if, you know if we want vouchers it, it takes a lot of work from the grassroots. Well the, the other aspect because I'm at a private school so you know we have the potential to be able to uh, benefit from that but I look at things holistically not every child is going to be able to attend Marion Middle School mm -hmm. or go to a school district which is um you know, has quote unquote, uh, a, a quality education for them. So you have to be able to advocate for what is the public school option to be viable for all children. And, um, you know, what potentially vouchers or even charter school for that matter, due to public school offering is siphon funding away from it and not make it better. Okay, great. Thank you to everyone in our audience who submitted questions for our panelists. We're sorry we're not able to get to all of the questions and we know you would like to cons consider continuing the conversation. You can do that on our Facebook page. So with the better understanding of the topic of education justice, and it is a complex topic, it's time to talk about next steps. Each of our panelists have provided suggested action items to help us as we move forward. Megan, tell us about your action item. Absolutely. The action item that I came up with is to, oh, there it is, is to pay attention to and engage with education at the local and state levels. And we've talked a little bit about this so far, but I'll break it down a little bit what I mean. Paying attention to what's happening in the schools around you. What school district do you live in? What's happening with them? That could be reading articles in the newspaper, online about education. That could be listening into the school board meetings, which are usually open to the public. That could be talking to a connection that you have at one of the schools to learn what's going on. Um, right now, there are large sums of money coming into education related to COVID relief funding. How is your district planning to spend that money? That is money we don't usually have. Um, so what's your, pay attention to what those things are going on. And now that you're paying attention, engage. That can mean writing a letter to your local school board. That can mean attending a school board meeting and speaking up about something. And I think the biggest, most important way, which we've touched on a little bit, is to vote in your local school board elections. Those are often elections that have pretty low turnout. 
But the school board, um, they are the people who decide who the superintendent is going to be. And the school board has a lot of power and say over how things operate in that school district. If we are starting at the local and state levels, um, you know, I think that's a really good place to start in this fight for education justice. Great. Thank you, Megan. Mary Elizabeth, tell us about your action item. So this also goes back to the conversation that we uh, just had. And what I'm recommending is that equity in education begins with individuals educating themselves so that you don't assume that it's somebody else's job to ensure that all educational systems are the same or um, that just because my child or family members are getting a quality education, I don't need to um, consider what other students are not getting. And so uh, I think that we should all be working together as a community to come up with creative and innovative solutions so that, uh, as I said earlier, the society as a whole begins to benefit from what becomes available for, for all students. Having said that, it doesn't mean that all children are the same. I think we know that even if we look at children within our own families, we know that all the kids in that family are not the same. Everybody is unique. And so in that uniqueness, there's value and talent that we want to cultivate within the confines of school so that these individuals can reach their potential, their God-gifted um, talents, and be able to contribute to the society that uh, they live in and the community that they live in. Um, also, because of their uniqueness, they probably may have a different culture than um, perhaps you do. So um, it should not be used uh, as a, a weapon. Race should not be weaponized. It just simply means if I can be spiritual for a moment here, I mean, God is the one that created um, the cultural differences and the uniqueness of individuals. And so I believe it is his intention to celebrate uh, what that diversity looks like to make it a, a richer environment and uh, resource for all of us. Um, and then I think that we should commit to providing a quality education for every child because every child has the potential to learn. Those learning, that learning may be different for each child in terms of how they absorb information, but um, they do at uh, their own, in their own way and at their own level have the ability to um, contribute and uh, succeed. Wonderful. Thanks, Mary Elizabeth. And Sister Mary, tell us about your action item. My action item is just kind of practical. I invite you to find a school in your area where students are in need of extra support. Um, search some school websites, call and volunteer to tutor or mentor students to help them develop their potential, gain confidence, make progress, and create a more just and equitable world. Beautiful. Thank you for those calls to action. And thank you to all of our wonderful panelists for sharing your experiences and your thoughts on education justice today. Thank you also to the incredible team of professionals working behind the scenes to bring this program to life every month. Next month, on Exploring Intersections, Catholic Sisters on Racism, Migration, and Climate, we discuss equitable access to healthcare. Access to quality healthcare is among the most basic of human needs, yet healthcare inequities remain, leading to health disparities or health outcomes linked to social and economic disadvantages. Is equitable access to healthcare possible? And if so, what steps must we take to get there? Our panelists will help us better understand this highly nuanced topic, February 9th. I hope you can join us. Thank you for being here today. This series is made possible through the Leadership Conference of Women Religious Region 10. Visit our website, exploringintersections.org to find resources mentioned in today's conversation or to register to attend our next program. We broadcast live every second Wednesday of the month at 3 p.m. Central. 
You can also download podcasts of our panel discussions from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or via our website. And be sure to connect with us for the continuing conversation on Facebook. I'm Cherish Badzinski, and thanks for tuning in to Exploring Intersections. Thank you.